Good afternoon, everyone. How is everyone doing? Uh, my name is Amit Kalamkar. I lead observability and analytics at Intuit. I have with me Vijit Morris. He is a principal engineer at my team. And today we wanted to talk about Intuit's observability journey using AIOps. Here is the agenda for today. Uh, first, we'll talk a little bit about Intuit, our observability strategy. Then we have a live demo where we can show how this observability strategy uh, is in action. Then Vijit will go over architecture and details on how we are achieving it. And lastly, we can do question and answers. Uh, you, most of you should know Intuit in, from our flagship products like TurboTax, uh, QuickBooks, MailChimp, Credit Karma, et cetera. We are one of the largest uh, uh, SaaS company out there. Uh, these on the top, you can see these are the five main platform areas within Intuit that powers all these products. This ensures that we provide value to our customers as well as we accelerate innovation. On the bottom, you can see the scale at which we operate. We operate at pretty large scale. Me and Widget both belong to developer experience and platform. Uh, our uh, group provides all the platforms, infrastructure, uh, and capabilities that are needed by these products uh, uh, to develop as well as operate. Uh, we also run at a very uh, large scale. For example, we are uh, around 1 million uh, CPU cores. And the investment which we have done in these platforms have resulted in 6x improvement in development velocity since 2019. Intuit is uh, very much believing a uh, believer in open source. Uh, we not only use it, but we also contribute a lot of things back. Um, Intuit is proud recipient of uh, CNCF End User Award, both in 2019 and 2022. Intuit also has uh, created an open source products uh, like Argo as and Numa Flow or Numa project recently. Intuit also has a lot of uh, contributors as well as mentors in different open source projects. So we are very much into open source and we want to ensure that we give back to community. So now let me start with you just giving a high level idea of uh, our uh, platform at Intuit. So if you look at the slide, this is our modern SaaS platform. We started the modernization uh, in 2018. Uh, we pretty much modernize everything, front end, back end, all the uh, boxes you see there. We also created paved roads, both for containerized as well as serverless app. Uh, this ensured that our developer have end-to-end -end automation from deployment, build, uh, as well as scale management. As part of this modernization, we deliberately make and made an effort to instrument everything out of box. So we get real-time events and metrics from the all layers of our infrastructures and platform, and we store that in our operational data lake. Uh, we also have a new uh, open source uh, AI ops platform called Numa Proj, which we use to do real time analytics on this and generating uh, actionable insights. Now, let me talk a little bit about observability strategy at Intuit. So, one of the principles we started with that we wanted our observability. Uh, to focus on how our customers are feeling. What is the customer impact? What is the revenue impact? Uh, we wanted to move away from a system-centric observability to more customer-centric observability. So all our strategy, uh, if you, you will see, is uh, customer-centric, and we rely heavily on AI ops to achieve this. So here are a few of the goals, uh, strategic goals we have at Intuit. We have a goal of MTTD less than five minutes, MTTR less than 40 minutes. Our availability target is 99.99 for tier one and tier two applications. And our performance SLA is less than four seconds. Uh, we build a lot of capabilities to achieve these goals. For example, for MTTD, we build RUM and FCI, uh, as well as golden signals, which comes out of the box. Uh, and these uh, metrics are, are connected with auto alert and incident creation, and that's helping us reduce our MTTD. For MTTR side of it, we have a centralized schematized logging, uh, as well as log analytics. And we also use distributed tracing, uh, dependency graph based on dependency tracing to isolate issues. And that's helping us reduce MTTR. 
for availability targets, we rely heavily on progressive rollouts uh, as well as automatic rollbacks using AI ops. Uh, and on performance sides of SIM, we have implemented a RUM performance uh, as well as anomaly score on these performance uh, metrics to achieve the uh, performance uh, targets. Now, let me talk a little bit about uh, observability pillars, which we have. Uh, we rely on logging to reduce MTTR. Some of the things which we are doing in logging includes root cause analysis as well as stack, tra uh, stack trace. Uh, metrics, uh, we have implemented golden signals as well as FCI, and they automatically alert uh, as well as create incidents when there, uh, there is an anomalous behavior in those metrics. Uh, we use dependency, uh, 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 we use tracing to uh, isolate the issue. Most of the things which you use there are called graphs and dependency. All this, our data is stored in the operational data lake. Uh, we use our AI ops platform, which is called Numa Proj, to analyze this data in real time. And then we show this on, on user interfaces and triaging flows, uh, which are very curated for a particular use cases, as well as these uh, real-time insights are used to trigger incidents as well as alerts uh, for, 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 for the developers. Now, let me hand over to Vijay to show all this in action and a demo. Thank you, Amit. Now, uh, let me show what our demo, what our triaging process is, right? And for that, let's pretend that I am an application developer who just got a page or an alert. And it all starts with the entry point. And so um, we have many ways to get an alert. Uh, it could be through the page duty, but this is one way of getting the alert. That is, we see it in a Slack channel. These alerts are very contextual. So what it means is when we give an alert, we talk, we talk about what is the, see, uh, the, um, for example, let's take this particular line item, right? It talks about the time it started, the number of users impacted, how many degraded was failed was there, right? What is the exact interaction that failed and what is the anomaly score that triggered the event? So all the alerts are based on anomaly scores. I'll get a little bit more into what, anomaly score is and how to quantify it but the key thing is alerts are based on anomaly score not only that we also in this um, contextual message we give a way to see the metrics that is through the if you click on the link you will see the metrics we give a link to the logging system and more importantly we give a link which brings into the observability tool which can be used to triage an issue so if i were to click on this link because this is the triaging experience that you will go through right you click on it, you see something like this. This is the TurboTax web app page, and this has a live incident, right? And the um, alert knows about the time. That's where the time component comes into play. It automatically selects the time, and it what you're seeing is a is a three col actually a color representation of anomaly score. The way to interpret this is written here. If an application is healthy, that is between one to three, everything is behaving within the normal operating pattern. If the score goes from four to 10, that meaning from a yellow gradient all the way to red, that meaning the application is heavily anomalous or deviant from the usual normal uh, operating pattern. One key point is this is not a dashboard, actually it's a tool. What it means is we, we collect a lot of data. Yeah? We collect around 10 tera, tens of terabytes of data per day. And we cannot just throw all the information to the user because it will confuse and it can they cannot prioritize what's happening. So we use anomaly score inherently to bubble up insights. So the first thing you see is anomaly insight. It talks about what are the interactions that are failing and what is the anomaly score. So higher the anomaly score, more important it is. Now, along the journey, you will also see that um, we also summarize, say, how many failed interactions are, uh, how many users are impacted, and these are dissected in different ways. When you are looking at a top level entity, this is the total number of users impacted as a service or a web app as a whole. But we could, I will show how to dissect or slice and dice this much as we go down the demo. One key thing developers use is the dependency graph. The moment they get try, uh, they get into an alert, they want to figure out whether the problem happened because of them or because of somebody else. Now, in this, you can clearly see the triaging view that, hey, there is a search widget that has a problem, which is because this backend, you can see the story behind this line, right? It's clearly highlighted. A search widget had a problem, which has a search service and the orchestration service has a problem. 
this kind of dependency graph can get quite complex, right? Meaning if you were to see into this graph, we even show how many changes have been applied in real time. The point here is the data what we are showing is being curated and being merged from different data sources. So we can give a unified experience for the developer to walk, at, walk through this dependency graph as they see. And we even highlight the edge relationship using anomaly score. The value six is because this interaction has a anomaly of six, even though the other service seems to be not operating in the normal operating pattern. So that is how you need to understand how important the data curation and the integration with anomaly score happens. Now, um, let me go down the journey and help you understand a little more about what I meant by slice and dice. So one could say that, hey, it's not about the total score. You can even search by browser plugin and get even more uh, slicing and dicing of information. I will keep going in the interest of time. One important factor is that we have an out of the box price analytics. Now, if you see here, these fields are auto populated by the anomaly scores. We, in the earlier thing, we saw that the water uh, interactions that's the highest anomaly and we auto populated that fields and we did a search. Okay, so this is a price analytics. There's a better way to see this too. So let me show the price analytics down after going through a little more in detail what I meant. So if you see uh, as, as I told earlier, search was the one that was impacted. And there's a table here. Let me collapse this for you. It is sorted by anomaly score. So search widget performs, this is the most impacted one. And this is where I can show you the slicing and dicing in a little more cleaner fashion. So you can see that the failure rate has increased and the number of user impacted is 100%. This is very specific to this search, this interaction. It's not. So we are able to slice information per interaction and even at much granular level using browsers and things like that, okay? Now, let me, as a developer, you know that I have a problem with search widget. And then what you do is you get even curated version of this trace analytics where it clearly calls out with more fields where it is the CA, the CA standing for customer interaction. It has failed and the type is interaction and the plugin and the widget. This is auto-populated and it will give you a trace analytics view. If you were to click on this, you will end up in a complex price view, something like this, right? Um, the This red by sure shows that it's a failure. And if you were to scroll down, you will see that why it failed, right? So the key thing I wanted to uh, show to you was the journey from an alert all the way to uh, getting the information, curating the information, collapsing all together and giving a view and a guided path where we use anomaly insights inherently so that we can sort and we can filter out data so that one could reach to the uh, right set of debugging information. Now, one key thing I want to show is we also have access logs. So the moment you get to the trace, you can click on this access logs and you will see that what are the logs related to that problem, right? It's And logs are the best friend of a developer, right? So we give all the way from the customer failure from Slack, from our alerting, contextual alerting system, all the way to the logs, in which includes tracing to guide the user. Now, let me uh, talk about architecture, right? So if you have to build a system like this, this is, we need much more than just observability data. This has to come from multiple layers. Now, that's the reason we start off with an operational data platform. Um, now, what is operational data platform, right? So in, uh, in observability domain, we talk about logs, metrics, traces, but from our standpoint, there's much more to it, right? We collect information at real time from Kubernetes clusters, build systems, our um, API gateway, that is a black box inference, uh, mesh kind of, uh, you can think about mesh kind of architecture, security data. We, the, the dev portal is a developer portal. If you, if you remember in the demo, right? We uh, let me go back there. I show you every service at Intuit, right? We'll have a tab here which says that observability. That meaning we have to have a golden entity that ties everything together, right? So that is how 
we have that information all coming in at real time and observability is one of those data sources that coming in i will, I will deep dive into observability shortly but i just want to give the scale of the art data platform architecture this is not a bespoke architecture which we build just for observability this is an architecture that powers much more than observability so let's take in the right most side the use cases that we support using this platform Runtime uh, um, uh, CVs, compliance uh, detection. We use cost. See, uh, you remember in the earlier slide, I'm told about 1 million cores. How do you attribute it, the cost to each and every BFG? We need a platform that can support that scale, right? And then observability, of course, that's the key thing, right? So this is a platform that supports it. Now let's talk about how we do it by the two central aspects. First and foremost, we have storage and cataloging system. This is only possible if you have clean data being ingested into a system, which supports curation at ingestion, right? We at source itself, we need to make sure that there's a data is clean, it is attributable. There is no dark data coming in because data is costly. Tens of terabyte will cost you a lot in, in just a matter of days. So every data we get is very contextual and very useful so that we can work it. So that is the storage and the cataloging part. Second is processing discovery and search. The key thing what we did is, is the central brain aspect of it. This is the new approach aspect where every data that is coming at real time can be assigned insights. We assign anomaly scores, we assign uh, enrichments and so forth so that we have context about every input that is coming into the system. For open, so this platform is extendable. For when we adopted and extended our observability system, we added like let's say tempo store so that we can store the trace as is and we can retrieve the trace. We also the whole system is based on open source technology. There is no proprietary whatsoever. The Elasticsearch is the, the open source Elasticsearch, which is used for inverted indexing, and we use Druid and Apache Flink. We use Apache Flink for very heavy high-end number crunching because the scale we at the scale we do and we so this is more like a data engineering problem which is a centralized data engine we have entire data is exposed via api this is a graphql api and this response time sla is in sub milliseconds uh, this exposes the operational data platform as a business logic and that's how multiple use cases are being fit and we democratize the data which we store so we have a very clean interface to pull the data out so there are two aspects. First one is the data curation and the data lake. So any data that is structured, unstructured, events or metrics should be, be stored in data lake. And it is only possible by having a data mesh kind of architecture. So what we do is we have a golden entity for every data set and we track that. So ODL is in the end becomes a warehouse for clean, documented, schematized operational data. It uh, helps us drive faster automation and better decisions because it's real time in nature. You can, uh, we can, uh, you will see shortly what I mean by real time in nature, right? And then we do AI analytics on top of the data that is stored in ODL. To do this at that scale, see the problem is systems like Flink are data engineering tools that is done centrally. But if you have to move the problem all the way to source and get clean enriched informational data, we need to build a very lightweight system that can analyze stream process, that is that can do lightweight stream processing with some analytics. So we, this is why we built a new project called Numa Project. It's an open source project. It's a Kubernetes native language agnostic real-time data analytic tool. It has two parts, Numa Flow and Numa Logic. Numa Flow is the um, central engine for doing computation on a streaming uh, on a stream uh, unbounded input. While Numa Logic is a collection of ML models and libraries. This Numa Logic can work by itself as a library because it's a collection of ML models, but it works the best when it runs on Numa Flow. Now you can do analytics on a streaming engine. So that's how these both are married together. So what is NumaFlow? I'll just give you a brief introduction to it. So let's assume that you have a stream coming in, okay? And the way you have to see is as a developer, you need to do some language agnostic computation, which is very stream processing computation actually, which is very easy for anybody to do it. So the whole point is easy to use. Any machine learning developer, a machine learning engineer, or an application developer should be able to do stream processing at a very lightweight, cost-efficient manner. With that in design, let's assume that you have a source the source is all about reading data from source. This is what NumaFlow provides out of the box. Then it guarantees that the next the 
processing of the source is passed up to the user defined function. It could be a map or a reduce function where we do data processing using windowing. One example you could imagine is for our a, a neural, um, neural logic, which uses a neural network for some computations, it needs a sliding window of 10 minutes. So how do they do that? We just write it in UDF saying that group by 10 minutes use sliding window as a strategy. And suddenly their uh, UDF will get data allayed in that format. Then they could, and the output is flat map, it's zero one or more results. They could do conditional forwarding, meaning they can choose which path to take. This is for A-B testing and performance analysis on ML models and so forth. And then we persist the data to sync. It could be blob stores, meaning right back to Kafka, S3, update Prometheus, whatnot. Now let's take a look back and see, hey, how does observability architecture fit into operational data platform. So Intuit's uh, front-end design is based on micro front-end architecture, meaning it's composed of a lot of smaller composite things like plugins and so uh, plugins and other things. And in, um, any front-end system is auto-instrumented. That's the key thing. So in the developer portal, you say that I want to create a, a web app or a plugin. It scaffolds a code that is instrumented with FCI code. So as a developer, they don't have to do anything. It's auto-instrumented. The, uh, the core library has it, right? And when a, a UA is being rendered to the user through mobile app or through a web app, it creates the root span. And then it forwards the span all the way to the backend end to end, okay? The moment we get a span, we the, our open telemetry collector collects it and send the span directly to operational data. Like here we use, uh, the way we do that is we write to Kafka, the metadata and S3 as the data mover because we, we do millions of spans a, day, uh, spans a minute. Okay, this is a very high throughput system. And then we inject it, we do all reverse indexing and whatnot. In the meantime, we also use our new approach to listen on this and create something called red metrics to understand how the each interaction is working, each operation is working and assign anomaly score right away. That's the reason we are able to bubble up the insight. And that also goes to operational data lake. And the UI, what happens is it just pulls in the data, merges all together, and we should give it as a visualization to the developer. So that is how we fit uh, the observability design on top of our operational data lake or data platform. One last thing I want to talk about, how do we do streaming AOPS? Because uh, it, at scale, it can get tricky. So the way we do it is any data provider, okay, it could be Kafka, Prometheus, or anything, it streams in the data, it's always streaming. So if it is Prometheus, you can imagine it's a, it's a remote, right? If it is Kafka, it's a, it's a Kafka, right? It's a, anyway, it is uh, streaming in nature. So we go for feature engineering. This is where we analyze the metric. We understand whether it's, what kind of metric type is, and we, we, we have a, uh, a pre-processing on the feature. Then we do ML inference, okay? And then post-processing happens. This is where the score gets normalized between zero to 10 because we want to make sure the anomaly score is interpretable for everybody and it remains the same across into it. Everybody knows what zero means, what 10 means. Now, operational systems are very dynamic in nature, meaning you might see new interaction being added, for example, if it is a customer interaction or old interaction moving, being deprecated. So sometimes we will not have a model because this is very dynamic and we, are, we want a system that can scale on demand. So what happens is in case it does not find a model, it will trigger an inline training where it trains the model, loads it in the model store and it will do a fetch. So that way we have an end-to-end -end system where uh, we don't have to, uh, we auto-detect, that's the right thing. We auto-detect the changes and adapt and adopt the, um, the right set of inferencing and model scoring systems. So that's all we had. Um, as you clearly see that uh, Argo approach is something into it started and uh, it, it is well adopted across the community and across the industry. And we start, and the same team has started new approach. And um, we, are make, uh, we are quite sure that we'll make a big impact with the new approach. And uh, please uh, uh, contribute and we are hiring. This is a small um, QR code if you want to learn more about new approach. Lastly, we'll open up for questions and answers.